five-year plans and the part that the major American corporations, major world corporations, played in building up the Soviet Union. Well, there are two separate um, phases here. The, the new, econ new economic policy was uh, started in 1923 by Lenin, and I found, and I published this in my first book from Stanford, that every single Russian industry was rebuilt or restarted by foreign corporations, mostly German, British, French, and American. By 1928, uh, Russia was back to approximately its 1913 um, in industrial output. And at that point, uh, she began to think of these grandiose five-year plans. And in 1928, Goss Plan, which is the, the uh, Russian Government Planning Commission, actually designed an initial five-year plan, but this was thrown out, it was in inadequate, and American corporations were built in, uh, were, were brought into Russia. And the first five-year plan and the second five-year plan were actually designed in the United States by American corporations. And Abu Khan laid out the basics of the first five-year plan for the Soviets. And then we find, again, the same corporations involved with the construction of the plants. International General Electric, most certainly, uh, DuPont, Ford Motor, Hercules Motor, uh, Curtis Wright in aircraft engines, and even some corporations which today were forgotten about, like Valti and uh, Chance Vought. These were aircraft manufacturers at that time. And so American corporations came in and they built the first five-year plan. But what was important, the Soviets then copied these plans, and this accounts for the tremendous Russian output. They took this initial equipment and they multiplied it, they copied it by the hundred. By now, how about Ford Motor Company? Did they play a part in the building up of the Soviet potential? Uh, very definitely. Uh, Ford Motor Company built the Gorky plant, and the Gorky plant produces uh, the GAZ series of vehicles, that's G-A-Z, and these are trucks, and there's uh, some automobiles. And uh, right from the early 1930s, you find that the GAZ plant has had military potential, and Ford knew that when it went in and built the Gorky plant. And we know it because I found statements to this effect within the State Department files. What part did the American Unleashed program play in building up Russia's industrial capacity after the Second World War? Well, Lend Lease built up Russia's capacity, modernized it, and expanded it during World War II. And there was some continuation all the way through perhaps to 1948-1949. There was a program after Lend Lease which was supposed to be restricted to foodstuffs and industrial materials, but in effect, uh, I checked the records in the warehouses in Suitland, Maryland, I find that even after World War II, and this was against the intent of Congress, I suspect, there was a massive transfer of the latest industrial equipment to the Soviet Union under the so-called Lend Lease program. American forces were held back for a while while the Soviets occupied East Germany. They stripped East Germany. They took back the latest of the V-2 rocket technology from Pinamunda and other places. And the V-2 became the basis of the uh, Russian space technology. Now, if you skip the inter 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 intervening years, you will find when you come to the early... Uh, 1970s that the Russians did not have the capability to move their missiles. And in particular, they lacked the ability to produce the very precision, micro-miniature ball bearings that are needed for the control systems. There was only one company in the world, Brian Chuck and Grinder, which could make the machinery, which machines the races which, within which these ball bearings run. And without those races, you just cannot make uh, moved missiles in any quantity. You can make one off, but not in quantity. Brian Chuck and Grinder was allowed to ship to the Soviet Union 45 of the mach these machines at a time when we only had 33 in the United States. But wasn't there any objection to doing this? I objected at Miami Beach in 1972. Other people objected, but the objections were squashed. And predominantly at fault here is uh, Henry Kissinger and the incoming administration, the incoming Nixon administration. The, this was known, uh, I'm sure it was known in DOD. If I knew it, then certainly DOD know, knew it. But the objections were squashed, and there was, a, uh, there was suppression of the information. And so once again, we see America building up the military capacity, the m nuclear threat from the Soviet Union. Well, this goes, you know, when you talk about moving of missiles, you're talking about...
During the Vietnamese War, the Soviet Union and the Eastern European satellites were the primary suppliers of war materials to the North Vietnamese who were killing American boys in South Vietnam. Would you comment on our aid and trade with the Soviet Union and with the Eastern European satellites during that period of time? Well, there's no question that uh, the Soviets were the prime suppliers of military equipment and supplies to the North Vietnamese. Let me give you an example. Um, the American pilots, as they flew over the Ho Chi Minh Trail, described the trucks that they were seeing as American trucks. Well, they were American trucks because they came from the Gorky plant, and Gorky was built by Henry Ford. And so you have the situation where um, we were, in effect, supplying both sides in the Vietnamese War. But the trucks were being built by the Soviet Union. However, were they getting any materials from the United States to help build those trucks? Yes, um, in the early 1970s. I know specifically of shipments of equipment into the Gorky plant while the war was going on, which in effect were aiding the Soviets to build more trucks to be used by the, by the North Vietnamese. How about loans? Was 60% was built abroad, only 40% in the Soviet Union, and that largely to Western design. But when you come to marine diesel engines, you find something really fascinating. You find that 80% of the marine diesel engines in Soviet merchant ships are Western engines. Uh, Burmeister and Wayne of Copenhagen, Copenhagen Salza of Switzerland, Fiat of Italy, because that name has come up before. But the other 20% of marine diesel engines built in the Soviet Union are built to Western design under technical assistance contracts from Salza and uh, Burmeister and Wayne. So in effect, there could be no Soviet merchant marine without assistance from the West. How about the building of the Kama River plant? Kama River was built in the late 1960s, early 1970s. The basic design the contract was let to the um, Italian firm of Fiat. Uh, Giovanni Agnelli is the chairman of the board. And uh, this is important because Agnelli is tied in with Chase Manhattan Bank. He's on the uh, International Advisory Committee of Chase Manhattan. Uh, what caught my attention was that Fiat does not manufacture automobile manufacturing equipment. All the Fiat plants in Italy are or contain American equipment. And what I found was that the equipment was coming, perhaps about 60-70% of it, from the United States, from major automobile equipment suppliers in the United States. I think the, it was known as the Fiat plant as a cover um, to perhaps divert attention from the fact that during the Vietnamese War, we were building the largest plant in the world. It covers 36 square miles. We were building for the Soviets with American equipment, the largest plant in the world. And so it was called the Italian Fiat plant, and I think this was a blind. And so they were what are their, their chief trucks. accomplishments in molding a domestic and foreign policy and actual events in American history since their founding at Yale? One is they have acquired enormous political and financial power. You'll find representatives of the order in politics. As what I have they done with this power? What, have they, what has happened to okay. America that would not have happened had they not been the order? Uh, creation of war and revolution. Specifically, which ones? Do you I, have documents the third, on that? The third book in this series, which I'm bringing out, takes two wars and one revolution. Well, two revolutions, excuse me, two revolutions and one war. Uh, World War II, the Bolshevik Revolution, and the rise of Hitler, which I call a revolution in Germany. We can find the order behind the Russian Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution. We can find the behind the rise of Hitler. We can find the behind, we can find the be in the maintenance of both of these systems, the now, transfer of technology to both. Since you've already proven that Wall Street is behind the Bolshevik Revolution and the rise of Hitler, now you're proving that the order is behind Wall Street. Exactly. Trilateral Commission about managing conflict, not solving conflicts, but managing, managing conflicts. Conflict. conflict management. That's the that's the um, that's the cry. So they got the profit, the power, and the management. Mm -hmm. Where do they want to steer history through the Bolshevik Revolution? They wanted to set up, and they did, uh, two opposing forces. Out of that came World War Two. Yeah. Um, there were logical steps in the process. They used the same bank, Guarantee Trust Company as the conduit for the financing of Hitler and also as a conduit for financing and also the early days of the Russian Revolution. In fact, in Russia, Soviet Russia in 1923, a vice president of Guarantee Trust Company was 
the foreign director of the Ruscom Bank, which was the first Soviet overseas bank that was set up. They were that close in those days. You'll get a very close relationship between the early Hitler days and members of the order, which is in the third book.